Okay, that, um, I'm, so I'm Christophe van Tommen, um, um, co-founder together with Laura of uh, Pronofix. So we're a company that specializes in developer portals. Um, we, are, we used to be a Drupal shop, um, like a Drupal agency. So, and, um, that's why I was asking uh, what language. Um, but um, we, for, for 12 years, um, we wanted to specialize in something. Uh, because we were like doing e-commerce, a bit of this, a bit of that, like all over the place. And, and I always felt bad not being able to um, like really support customers with the, the, the human part of the work that we were doing. Like um, you would build a community site and then like how do you build a community? Uh, you would build an e-commerce site, like what are the best practices for selling online? And these are all very different things. And and every time it was different. And so I didn't feel good about that. And then um, six years ago or something, I got excited about DITA. And um, like my colleagues thought that was crazy. Um, <laughs> because like, you know, documentation, like what? <laughs> um, and then, um, so we did, we did a few things. We did a few projects, but it didn't really work that well um, because there was not that much demand for it. For, for building an open source, because there's a lot of tools for it already. And then uh, three years ago, um, at an API conference, I, I started talking with uh, <coughs> Kevin from Apigee. Uh, sorry, there was um, first uh, Jeremy from Apigee. Um, at Apigee is an API gateway. And lo and behold, their developer portal was built in Drupal. And they needed people to work on their portal. Um, for because they had a they had a proposal <coughs> for somebody here like a mapping company here um, that you all know and um, they um, so we won the bids we built the portal and it was like the start of a, of a relationship. My uh, our colleagues were a lot more excited about API documentation <laughs> than, <laughs> than about documentation in general and and from then on we've been specializing so it's now almost three years that we've been specializing in developer portals. Um, and so in uh, this presentation is like massive brain dump of <laughs> just like take all the slides and put everything together. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll go through a bunch of different things. If there's something you want a bit more, um, like to go a little bit deeper on, if you, there's something you don't understand, just give a shout, it's a small room, so, okay. Um, I, I do this thing where before I do a presentation, I always start with saying thank you, because um, uh, this is like, as the one who is being delegated to go to places and as CEO, um, you know, I get a lot of privilege and I get a lot of things, like a lot of resources for, for um, doing things and going out and talking to people and so on and so on. So it's very easy to start thinking that that's this, this, this one person, he's like, you know, does all these things. And, but I, that's not just me. Um, when, and I think there's something that I'm, we're, we're, we're doing, besides our developer portals, we're doing some thinking about um, how, how to, like an other way of, of it, um, assigning value. It's, it's a very complicated story and I won't go into it. But um, in a short version, I want to say thank you to <laughs> the community because all the things that I'll be talking about in this talk are um, ideas and thoughts that I've accumulated across different communities. Um, uh, Drupal, to some extent, um, mostly on a technical level, but Writer Docs for sure. Um, DevRel, if you're into um, developer evangelism, if you wanna learn more about how to sell APIs, you should definitely go to DevRel conferences. And then the uh, API days and API strategy community. So it's like, a lot of communities where I've been learning. Uh, so when, when I talk, this is not just my ideas. Most of it comes from other people. Um, also, there's a, our team that is like, most of them are not traveling, like none of them are traveling as much as I do. Um, so, uh, and I want, I want to say thank you to them publicly so that you can, um, because I wouldn't be able to give this talk without them and my family. <laughs> so. Um, um, because yeah, they also make it possible for me to be here. <clears throat> so, but first, what is developer portal? Um, I, does everybody know what is developer portal? And I'm lo especially looking to the students because uh, no. this is probably you, right? <laughs> so, so developer portal is like, um, 
so you know APIs, right? APIs are, are meant to do integrations with, between different systems. So APIs, um, it's an application programming interface. It's a sort of contract between services. So you can, and the cool thing is that it's like a, a default contract. So you don't have to build it from scratch every time because you, just like banks have um, like these default contracts for loans and so on, it's something similar. You have a default contract for interacting with uh, a service. Um, now, <clears throat> you need some place to talk about that because you don't want to explain every single person over and over and over again, like this is how you can integrate with our services. You, you want like a, a website where you can explain how the integration works and that's a developer portal. So it's a, it's a place where you explain how uh, you can integrate with an API and then build, um, build something on top of that, be that an application or uh, a connection with your own software or or some or maybe another API. So that's that's a developer portal. So and because of that developer portals play not just um, a technical role, they also play kind of a somewhat obscure commercial role, you could say, because you know we we don't like to say that this is a commercial site, but actually it is also a little bit, you know, it's it's about promotion. Uh, you you have to you have to explain what you're doing. Um, preferably not in a manipulative way. So you don't want to do the, the, the hardcore, oh, it's perfect, and so on and so on. You have to be honest. Um, but it, it still has a, a sales and marketing function. So, but most of the time, when you go on the internet, you'll see this. And this is like Swagger UI. Um, it's, um, so when you, when you have an API, like we already heard Swagger earlier, so Swagger is a, is a documentation standard uh, that explains, uh, that has like a, um, a standardized way of explaining how an API can be reached. Okay. So in, um, Swagger UI is a, an open source tool for displaying Swagger. The problem is that that is a very technical aspect of an API, but all the other aspects are often left out. So what, when you go online, you often find this as like our developer portal, and, uh, but you, you don't know how to get started. There's no clear explanation of what an API does. It's just like, boom. So one of the key things to remember is that this is not a developer portal. Um, so what is the purpose of a developer portal? Um, I already talked a little bit about it, but I think one of the key purposes of portals is that it's, it should be a self, uh, self-service hub. So it should be a place where, as a developer, you can go there just log in, get an account, and start developing. Most of the time, it's not that. Most of the time, you go there, you request <coughs> access, um, somebody sends an email, they, you have to send an email back, they send another email back, and you, you're, you do it like after one or two weeks, hopefully, <laughs> you get access and you can start developing. That's not really the best way. Normally, what you should try to do is that you go to the developer portal and you can start programming without any human to have to like still still check. There's some caveats, depending on, on how sensitive your information is. Um, maybe you'll need to set up a sandbox with data that's uh, like with um, example data. Like if you're a bank, you probably want a sandbox environment so that people don't start messing with people's accounts. <laughs> and, um, um, but it's, yeah, that, that's kind of like the basic thing. But this, most people see this. The thing that most people don't know or don't think about is that the developer portal is also trust signal. Uh, and Kun uh, from ABN, he, he really loved this slide. He was like, can I, can I steal this slide and show it to management? <laughs> because because um, what, the way I, I see a portal, a developer portal is, is, is a little bit like a bank, like the bank building. Why the hell do, uh, do banks spend so much money on their bank buildings? They're not stupid. They, they know really well what they're doing. Um, they're very commercial, so they're not wasting money. On like, this is on purpose. So the reason why they do that is because they're trying to engender trust. They want to show, like, we've got so much money that we can even build this kind of building and still be in business. And this is, I, I believe that a developer portal is a little bit like that. That it is a, is a, um, a way of showing, you know, uh, we've done our work, we're not going to go away. This, this API is for real. And uh, don't worry, you can integrate with it. Um, it's, you know, we're not gonna drop you. 
And I, I think that's that's a really important message. If you if you want to go to management and explain why you should be spending money on developer portals, this is the reason. You know, tell them the bank building thing. <laughs> okay. um, it's also that besides that, it can also be kind of like a, a mission control for your API strategy, because um, there's a lot of different API strategies. And your, your API strategy should be adopted to your business strategy. Like what are, what are you trying to achieve with your business and why are you doing APIs? Um, there's, quite, there's quite some, it's a little bit of a hype right now to do APIs. So everybody's jumping on it and not everybody knows what they're doing. Um, so probably you should be thinking about how does your API feature in your overall business strategy and how can you make it uh, stronger together? Uh, and, and then that can, needs to be reflected in your developer portal. Um, and then um, the, another key thing is that um, if you don't have a good developer portal, uh, you're basically going to have such a bad experience that you're going to spend a lot more money uh, and time on support and training. So that's, that's another sales point. What's DX? Developer experience. I'll, I'll, I'll um, yeah. I'll That's talk more about it later. <laughs> so um, arguably, at least in my view, developer portals should be one of the first things you invest if you're doing an API program. Um, probably you need an API first, uh, although you could argue even <laughs> there. Um, like you, you could, for example, if you're doing internal APIs, you could start with uh, um, like a portal where people can submit ideas for resources that could become APIs. Um, and uh, and then have like a workflow that leads them through process step by step from <coughs> idea all the way through to maturity um, and, and publication. So yeah, I, I think it's it's really important. <laughs> so, so what is developer experience? Mm -hmm. um, developer experience, uh, one way to look at it is uh, to say what it is not. Developer experience is not API friction. So it, when you have a lot of API friction, then you have a really bad experience. And API friction is everything that destroys value in your API. Uh, and that can be a lot of different things. And I'll go through uh, a couple of them in a, in a moment. Um, one, one way that I like to look at developer experience and API friction is, is to look at friction along the developer's journey. Um, so, so for the, the developer that is going to be integrating with your API, there's these six steps that they go through, uh, and um, like at each step, there's <coughs> opportunities to either increase or reduce friction. Uh, well, preferably, you're reducing friction, but um, uh, I'll, I'll go into, the, into them in a, in a moment uh, more in detail. Um, so the, this whole idea of API friction comes from uh, Bruno Pedro. So it's one of those people from the community that I want to shout out to. Um, uh, he, he wrote an article on Medium about um, API friction as a thing. And I was like, yes, this is, this is good. Because I had been talking about friction as like a um, conceptual idea, but to, to bring it out as its own thing was kind of interesting. Uh, and the way I, I see it is that you could kind of create a sort of Ohm's law of API friction, um, which, uh, <laughs> which is basically that your API usage is your perceived API value divided by your friction. Now, it's not you know, mathematically correct. There's no numbers, there's no, but you know, follow along. <laughs> um, then developer experience is invert, uh, inversely related to your API friction. So then you get something like this, which is that your usage of your API will depend on your perceived API value and your developer experience. Now, I say perceived value because um, um, if you have a really great API, um, if you don't explain what it does, nobody's ever going to use it. So it, the perceived value is what is really critical. Um, if you've got a, a really good API, probably you won't have really great developer experience because normally these things are, are connected with each other. But still, you know, even if you have a pretty good API, if, if you haven't worked on the developer experience, like the documentation bits and, and the, the other bits around it, then um, people won't use it. So you need to get both of these things need to be going up so that your API usage goes up. And both of these things happen to be things that you can influence on your developer portal. So if you have um, a good, like 
you can explain what the value is of your API on your portal, and you can improve the developer experience with your portal. And that brings us to, so but, but like a little bit more concrete. Um, how do you reduce friction along the developer's journey? Um, so we talked about these six steps, <coughs> or I showed them earlier. So the first step, the discovery step, is, is about this perceived value. It's like, what is possible with this? And one of the key things for that is that you need uh, landing pages uh, that uh, are easy to find and that, that uh, help people <coughs> to navigate your documentation and your portal. Um, also, well, you, you, I use this example because um, I think the production value of your, of your landing pages, like how beautiful they are and how well structured they are, has a big impact on, on the perceived value also. So this is one of those areas where you can improve the trust and uh, you know the banking thing. Um, and um, um, another thing to think about is that you, you need to think about the different personas that will land on those pages and to make sure that they can find the information that they're gonna need. Um, Another way to, to uh, work on this is like with uh, <coughs> tutorials, like not, not really tutorials, but like guides uh, and like a, a very specific type of guides, uh, worked examples. Uh, we did a uh, talk about this at uh, Write Docs London. Um, and and I, I loved, I loved the, the story. There was this idea of worked examples, which is, um, it's like guides but they're not really detailed. So it's like explaining how you're going to do something without really explaining everything. So it's just enough to understand the complexity of the process, which is a brilliant idea, I thought. Um, so, and, and, th and this company, they started doing this because they had a really complex product that you could use for whatever. And, um, and they started doing this with their APIs and they saw a, like, a really good uptake on that. So then they started doing it for a lot more other things. And, um, and it became one of their key pieces in their documentation. And I, 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 yeah, I love the idea. Uh, so in Karen, she, she, yeah, it was also a funny talk. It was, it was a good, um, but we, did, we did recording. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next step is the evaluation. So once you've convinced people that, yes, this is a great API, yes, you want to use this, um, you, um, you need to help them to evaluate if the API will do what they need it to do. Here comes the production quality again, uh, the trust signals. Um, but I think also, um, sorry for the zapping, I, I think um, uh, like having uh, guides and some, some clear examples of, of different scenarios that you could use um, your API for can help with the evaluation process. So can I just yeah. ask a question just to clarify a little bit what we're mm -hmm. talking about? We have this um, six step process here. Yeah. So, is this, well, are we talking about a process for how we go about building the best APIs, or is this a particular this, product? This, this, this is like, no, 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 I... Um, so this is supposed just, to be the customer journey. It's a customer journey. So it's, it's like a mental model for thinking about, uh, like for looking at your portal and thinking about how to make it better. Okay, so it's it's not um, it's not tied to any one product. It's just just uh, um, yeah, well, it's a tool for for thinking about it. So um, next is getting started. The key here is that um, reference docs they're like the boundary of your tool. They're the boundary that's the, like they they explain everything that can be done with your API. But they're like the boundary. They're not the starting point. So when you're when you're when you have that reference docs, um, like you're kind of like dropped in the middle of nowhere, and and like you don't really know where you are, and you don't know how to get started with things. So um, you need um, read to learn to do materials like tutorials that explain how how you know you can get started, um, and um, maybe with SDKs you can also improve it. Uh, so that you can like skip over some of the difficulties with um, um, authentication problems, and like, this is one of the biggest things that are, uh, everybody keeps saying that um, most APIs the problem is the authentication step. Um, so helping people to get over that in their favorite platform, like for example in Ruby on Rails, if you have a Ruby on Rails SDK, then you don't need to figure out how to do the integration. Um, 
like on your own because you just get an SDK and it's there's a bunch of functions that you can just use as as a, without having to understand how the actual API works. So, um, and then preferably uh, your tutorials are also uh, applied to your SDKs, which which again simplifies things because now people just get some like an SDK in the language that they're familiar with, they can just get started with it, and there's a tutorial that explains them how to get started in their favorite language. So if you're just getting started, that's great, because you don't have to understand anything else. You just you know how to code in your language, and you just do that. Um, so that, that's why uh, it's probably a good idea to write your tutorials for, for your SDKs, if you have SDKs. Next is develop and troubleshoot. Um, guides help with that to some extent, because these are like the, the, the typical scenarios and typical problems people want to address. And of course, API <coughs> reference docs. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, without, that doesn't work. What's the difference between a guide and a tutorial in this context? Right, and I got that in a slide a little bit later. <coughs> um, so I'll, I'll talk in a bit more. Yeah, <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> just uh, yeah, um, okay. And then I added this celebrate phase because, um, like, what you want to show to developers is that you care about their app, or you want to show that you care about the integration that they're doing. If somebody somebody builds an SDK for your API, you want to like because this sometimes happens that there's no SDK for I don't know PHP. A PHP developer comes along, builds an SDK, puts it on GitHub, and then people start using that. You you want to celebrate that. You want to show that you care about that integration that they've done. Um, to some extent, uh, also for apps, individual apps, and, and showing that you know they're not just on their own. Um, but um, yeah, so that that's what celebrate is about. Um, so you you probably want to think about places where, where you can show those on your portal. Um, and um, and the last step is the maintenance. And maintenance is like the, the post care, um, API version updates and stuff like that. And um, um, API uptime and release notes uh, probably can help with that. Just So these are like the six places. Um, and th that's like the, the end user experience. Now, I got the spiel about internal developer experience. I won't go into it because it's way too much. But um, there's also like the the other developer's journey, which is the upstream developer journey, which is this one, which is it's like if you have a, a large organization with lots of teams doing their own APIs, or a large organization with lots of teams that have to do APIs, um, uh, they need to go through this journey, which is get everybody engaged in the process, uh, create a catalog of, of potential resources, um, uh, explain how to do design in a proper way, having a design style guide to, to, to improve that process, help with imp actual implementation of the API, a QA publish, and then feedback and support, and, and some shared resources for doing that. Um, and this is like, if you're doing internal APIs, you probably want to do this, um, you want to focus on this one, rather than on a downstream journey, because it's easier to do this one right, because if you do this right, the downstream deliverables will get better automatically. So if you explain, like, you know, we need to have documentation, we, we need reference docs in this format, they need to um, adhere to these standards, and so on and so on, then um, that will um, help you improve the quality of the deliverables that then get published on the downstream uh, in the downstream journey, and it's yeah th that that's kind of the idea. Yeah, right. The problem with large organizations is half the people don't go through the standards that you establish. And yeah, we already are facing a challenge with the old developer portal that is. Yeah, similar. did you did you set up any automated checking? Uh, so. Because it was an old, old portal, we did not have any automated checking yeah. mechanisms. It, it, uh, it was IBM WSRR, if yeah. you know about it. So that's when they brought a person uh, and uh, told that this person would be doing all of it for everybody else. Yeah. And we re removed the edit access for everyone else. Yeah. 
but in the long run uh, that's not very it's not, it's not very there's um so uh, we are we're going this journey now with with a few customers so we're we're still all, this is my dream <laughs> so we and, and i'm trying to make it reality um but um there's there's um um so the Ar Arnaud Loret, uh, API uh, handyman, wait, yeah, handyman, this is handle on Twitter. He has a um, um, API uh, style guides website with lots of API style guides um, from across the internet, which is really interesting. And uh, he has a stock, and I'm trying to convince him to do it at uh, API the Docs in Paris, um, where he, he also talks about um, a tool from Zalando, I think it's called Zali, that automatically check uh, checks uh, against certain style guides uh, criteria, so you can do some of that. Um, I think what I what I've been talking about is to have like a, a workflow process where you move to the next step in the workflow by adhering to certain criteria and and, and something like that. Okay. Um, but it's uh, yeah we we've got now uh, two or three like the th we're talking about the third one. Uh, um, companies that were working on something like that, so I can yeah, I can share more <laughs> about the, the how it goes. Um, I think I think the key there is um, to look at uh, gamification potentially, mm -hmm. and, and basically experience design, and and looking at um, uh, creating a process where you have quality checks, and then. Um, uh, an experience that is actually fun to do it or, or that you try to make fun and, and interesting. And I don't know yet how, how we're going to do that exactly. So it's, it's a ver it sounds very nice, I, I you know. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that um, so things I've been thinking about is like dashboards where you show um, how many APIs different units have, the quality of those APIs, um, having an overview with like five star ratings for the quality of an API depending on what criteria they've passed and stuff like that. So it, that that's yeah, uh, but well, let's talk more about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So so um, I won't go further in detail. I got I got um, another talk about that, but that's that's uh, yeah. Um, okay. So that was like developer experience and the different types of documentation and like from that perspective. There's another angle, which is like the five the five main types of, of documentation or the five main types of content um, uh, on the site. One is the overview pages. I already talked a little bit about that earlier. Uh, that help you navigate uh, your documentation. Um, a lot of people ask like, so how should I organize my docs? And like, yeah, it's hard um, because it depends. Um, do you have like a clear category, like set of categories? Um, do you have a clear set of, of users with different use cases that you can uh, use to, to segment the APIs that you have? Mm. This is not that obvious. It's um, um, like you see sometimes uh, that people will just do uh, language based. So, so for example, Ruby or PHP or whatever. Um, sometimes it'll be product based and they have like different product classes. Or sometimes there's like categories uh, or, or something. So it depends a little bit on how you want to structure it. Um, I think that there's no one size fits all. Um, I don't know if you know the Ice Bear book. Yeah. So if you're new to this, look at this stuff. That's really interesting. It's about um, it's, it's basically um, an introduction to information architecture and how to structure information. Uh, and what, what kind of tools are available to figure out how information should be structured. Um, it's a whole, yeah, it's a job on its own, but it's, it's a good place uh, if, if you haven't seen this before. Um, so there was a question about guides versus tutorials. And so all of this stuff is um, in DITA, they call it task oriented help. It's like you, you need to do something and there's like steps and, uh, and um, so the difference, yeah, is not super clear, or it, it feels intuitively, it feels kind of weird. I think the best way to think about it is tutorials are, are getting started. It's like um, 
they they show you where to where to, where to do something and 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 take you through the process. Guides are um, how do I do X? And they're more they're more explaining different user scenarios of your product of your API product, and then um, so they they make it more accessible for different people. So a tutorial is more <coughs> learn how to do, and a guide is more this is all the stuff you can do. I, I, at least that's my understanding. And then you still have like the, the worked examples that's still slightly different. Yep, that's Why would you make the difference? Um, they're both really important. No, but like if the tech writer here doesn't know the difference, it's, it's why expect your user to know the difference? You feel it. Yeah, I think, um, I think, yeah, this is a better way of making the difference. Um, this is from uh, Daniela Porcida. He did this talk at um, API the Docs in London and then also at Write the Docs. And he, he, he splits the, the content on the dev portal in like four categories. Like there's the tutorials, is teach me how to do this. There's the, the how-to guides, like that explain how to solve certain problems. Um, there's discussions as like uh, conceptual information. Um, what is Dunning? Or like like keywords that that might be domain specific language, uh, and then there's like the the you know exhaustive reference documentation. He argues that you need all four. Um, if you have only tutorials and not the how-to guides, then the the decision maker who doesn't really want to do the integration, but who still needs to find out if they can use your API, will get lost. If you have only had guides and you don't have tutorials, then the developer that needs to start doing things is going to think this is all marketing crap, and I can't can't really do anything with it. So that's no, that's I, the I difference. Agree. You need both categories. Yeah. But should you like in the previous one, Twilio really makes the user make a choice. Yeah. It's not good. And that's why not just have a list going like. Um, <laughs> you probably want to dis distinguish, but it's not really well explained. And I agree with you. Um, I liked um, Daniel Porcida. He 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 did an example of um, what? Sorry, cooking. Which one? He explained. Yeah, he has, a, he has cooking, cooking examples. Yeah. And he also he has the, the airplane thing. Yeah. How you find your way in the kitchen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. have to learn like the methods. Yeah, that's right. And then you have to learn the tools, and you have to learn the recipes. But he, different things. he showed how um, uh, how they do this in Django. Yeah. Like the Django developer portal, and um, and I, and I, I liked the way that it looked. I liked the the, the way that we, because I didn't just say tutorials and then go or guides and but they they had this tutorials and then um, start here if you need to do this or and then guides like here you can find pro um, answers to common problems. So like kind of explaining it again, it's kind of tricky. Um, yeah, I, I've I've always felt very ambiguous about it, uh, but but that's helped clarify. Yeah. So. Yeah. So actually, I have a slide about it. So that's that's how they show it in Django. So they that 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 is lines under the titles. That's not actual examples. It's an explanation, like start here for this and do that. And then yeah, worked examples again. Um, I think that I, I haven't really seen anybody doing it yet, but I think there's like a continuum between all of these things where you can maybe start with a worked example, kind of like a, almost as marketing content that explains uh, in a very high level way, <coughs> this is how you do it, that then links to tutorials that explain exactly how to do it, and then maybe guides with specific questions that are connected with it. And you can make this beautiful connected graph of content <laughs> kind of thing. Um, uh, yeah. Now, for internal APIs, you're never going to do that because you never get budget for it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. um, the third one is uh, SDKs. We talked a little bit about that earlier. So, SDKs, software developer kits, um, are um, kind of like a, a standard implementation of an API that you can just drop in your software, or drop in your app, and, it, and it's just supposed to work. I just input your key and, and you're going. Um, so as I said earlier, they, they help to encourage best practices uh, and to simplify stuff like authentication. Um, there's 
quite some interesting things about SDKs because how do you write all these SDKs and how do you keep them in sync with your API? Because your API keeps changing and then your SDK has to keep changing. But you know, if you have six SDKs for six languages, you have like six pieces of software that you have to keep in sync with your API, which is a massive headache. So um, yeah, there, uh, Tristan um, at DevXCon, he did this talk about how you should actually automate SDK generation. Um, and uh, I think he works at Stripe or he worked at Stripe at the time. I think he still works there. And uh, they're doing this. They, they've got um, like a, they have a template that they've been changing so that it's not just purely just spit out random crap, but actually fairly structured. But it's still, you know, it doesn't always, if you automatically generate SDKs, it won't have all the best practices from the different platforms. You still need people to, to really think about it and that know, you know what to connect it with and what are like popular libraries to interact with and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, and, and there's, um, there's other ways to do it because you could, so like for example, Keen.io, Keen Keen .io, they, um, they have a, a, this eight or seven, yeah, seven, uh, languages that they s officially support. And those are lang uh, SDKs that they maintain themselves. And then they have the community SDKs. And those are SDKs that the community contributed to um, to the project, that they, they made implementations for other things. And what they did, like I talked a little bit earlier about uh, Celebrate. So they are celebrating those integrations um, by, by putting them also on the site and then building relationships with those people. Because um, I heard the story about uh, PayPal that um, like they didn't have an SDK. Uh, I, I don't remember which language, but um, so, so people started making SDKs for PayPal's API. And now on GitHub, the biggest project is like is an SDK for an old API version. So when people go looking for PayPal payment API, they find this, this SDK that's still connecting to an old API. And that's not really nice, uh, and that, that can cause all kinds of headaches. So, so you 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 need to think about this stuff, and and like ideally, if you have people in the community building SDKs for you, build a relationship with them, uh, give them T-shirts, you know, like <laughs> at least work. right, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, maybe maybe you can even pay them a little bit of money, just for for maintenance and for keeping it up. Just make make sure they're they're friendly and nice, and they. You know, that if, if they disappear, that you can still get your hands on that project. Um, another way to think about it is that you could do this API auto-generated SDK and then have a best practices layer uh, on top of it so that you have kind of a mixture between handcrafted and generated. This is very deep, but um, uh, and yeah, I already mentioned this, tutorials for the SDKs. A new thing that I added recently, and this is interesting for you, um, is um, has anybody heard of uh, inner sourcing? Inner sourcing. This is a this is it's a thing. Uh, it's a term that uh, O'Reilly coined uh, at some Linux conference, and it's this idea that um, you take all the best practices from the open source world, like using uh, code repositories, pull requests. Um, this merit meritocracy, all of this stuff, and you use it inside of your organization. So if you've got a really large organization with lots of departments, they're now doing open source, but not open as in like everybody in the world can see what is going on, but open as in everybody in our organization has access to the code and can see what other people have been doing and can contribute to somebody else's project. So one thing that I, I suggested, uh, I had this idea that, um, when I was presenting at a bank in London, uh, and they were like, so yeah, but Christoph, how, how do you make all these SDKs? Because we don't have all that money. And there's like, oh, you could, you could inner source it. You could ask units, or when somebody makes an integration for an API, that they make uh, an SDK for whatever language that they're going to use. Is it Ruby on Rails? Is it um, whatever, Scala, whatever? Um, Make an, make an SDK, contribute it to an open repository, 
and then add it to your developer portal so that people, the next time somebody needs that same language, they can just use your SDK and build further on it and, and contribute to it. And, and you know. um, so, but it, there's, a, there's a conference dedicated to inner sourcing. So if you're from a large company, um, maybe it might be useful. Um, I got a, I submitted a talk about this stuff and I got a poster, which is kind of, you know, <laughs> takes me back to <laughs> the university time. But um, um, yeah, so that, that's uh, in Germany. There's going to be an inner sourcing conference by PayPal. <coughs> Fourth, API references. Um, key thing that I want to say here is, yeah, as, as I said, no, no developer portal should have, uh, should, should be without API reference docs. They're, they're definitely core of the MVP, uh, minimal viable product for, for a developer portal. Um, the, um, so if you're, everybody knew Swagger before? It's anybody that's, so um, Swagger is the old name of what's now called Open API specification. It's a long story. Um, uh, it's a really long story <laughs> and I, it's kind of a weird story. Um, but uh, so today, the leading specification language for APIs, for RESTful APIs, uh, is, is Open API spec. Um, What's an API specification? It's um, it's like it's it's a reference doc for for a documentation for an API. So it's it's like the um, that defines what are the endpoints, what are the parameters. So that you can, if if you want to build an integration, you can use that to know like what are all the, uh, like, um, yeah, what are all the things you need to think about uh, when doing the integration. Right? I, I don't know if that's a good explanation. If I could add to it, it's the way I usually describe it is, yeah. So it, like you said, it defines everything your API yeah. can do, and then you, then that's a, that forms a little seed for example generating some some basic code. That actually is your API generating some documentation. I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. So, that so it, it's like it's a specification. It's like the plan yeah. it, that it, that defines your API. Uh, or ideally, um, ideally, you start with your specification that explains how your API is going to work, and you and you can use that then as a sort of contract between. Um, um, the developers that are creating the API and the people that are going to be using the API um, to, to kind of start trying and, and maybe do uh, test implementation. You can also use it to test your API. Um, so there's tools that take a, a specification and will automate it, uh, automatically verify if your API is still fulfilling all the, uh, all the promises that you've made um, that your API is going to have. Yeah. And it's sort of slowly becoming a would you agree it's sort of slowly becoming a best practice in API building to do it this way, right? To start yeah. with the specification. I've heard some people saying like, yeah, but this is not everything, mm -hmm. right? There's um, there's now GraphQL, that's like the a new hype in the scene. Um, there's still a lot of old stuff around. Um, y yeah, so so it's, it's, not, it's not everything, mm -hmm. it's like, it's the big hype. So um, if you want to make money doing API documentation, this is the place to be probably right now. Um, but um, yeah, it's not everything. Okay. Um, one of the pain points with specification, um, with, with the spec is like, how do you integrate it with other documentation? Like if you have um, um, domain language so if you have certain words that you're using in your API <coughs> that you're explaining, conceptual documentation, how do you bring it into your um, um, your specification? And how do you link back to it? And that, that can sometimes be a pain point. We are, we're, um, uh, we're working with, well, we're talking with Professor Meng from Germany, Michael Meng. He's doing research on this actually. It's like, how, how do you combine um, conceptual documentation with your reference documentation and what does that mean for uh, the developer experience for less experienced and more experienced users. They, they found some interesting things about developers might not think they don't uh, might think that they don't need your your conceptual documentation so they might believe that they know everything and they just start working and then they bump into the wall and then 
um, so they they yeah they they saw that people that didn't have any that didn't have much experience with a certain domain they really needed the conceptual documentation and it was better if it was somewhere in the reference documentation on the other hand um, people that were really experienced they they really didn't need it and so they, they were they were looking at how much how much can you gain in, in developer experience by um, by including conceptual documentation so it's a, it was interesting research sometimes you want to and I, I, I was looking for a login screen and this was the one I picked but um, uh, sometimes you're gonna have API's that should be accessible by certain people and not by other people like um, you might have a partner API that's only accessible by partners um, and you don't want anybody else to know about it we had one customer they had um, they had two two of their biggest customers were competitors of each other. So they had built an API for, for this one customer and the other customer should definitely not be able to see that. So that, that kind of stuff happens. And then, then um, while you can do it with static sites, because most of the developer portals are built with static site generators, um, role-based access control is still a lot easier with the CMS. And, and, and yeah, something to think about. If you're gonna have partner APIs, you need to think about role-based access control and being able to say, you know, this group. And what is this? Uh, content management system. Sorry, lots of acronyms. <laughs> so um, it's um, uh, tools like Drupal, Django, WordPress. These are um, these are content management systems. And last is the support resources. Um, you know, if you're going to have frequently asked questions, which is a big if. Sometimes you don't want that, but if you do, then don't just make this long list of stuff. Nobody reads that. Just try to grant, like make it easier to digest, like make categories in it. Um, you could think about graphics. I'm not sure if I like that much, but um, yeah, just just try to uh, group your contents to make it more digestible. Um, if you're doing community, be very, very careful. <laughs> um, most communities become tumbleweed towns where nobody ever comes. Um, so if you're gonna do a community, you need a community manager who's gonna be uh, you know, making the community live. And, and that's a lot of work. Um, just seeding the, the, the forum with content, uh, making sure questions get answered, stuff like that. Uh, encouraging people that are contributing it's it's a, it's a lot of work, uh, and and if you just put a forum on your developer portal, it's very very little chance that it will work. And uh, uh, sometimes it's just better to go where the developers already are going, like Stack Overflow. That's probably the best place to go if it's an open API, because people will be asking questions there anyway. Uh, of course, if it's a partner API and it's only accessible cert to certain groups, then that doesn't work. Yeah. One downside of doing Stack Overflow is also that you don't own the conversation. Yeah, exactly. For example, if you organize a conference, there's no place to make an announcement. Yeah. So that's there's definitely, there's, um, I, I'm pretty scared of the centralization of the world. Uh, like, uh, we're all putting our content in other people's power, and that's not a good idea. Um, at the same time, yeah you have to be pragmatic we, we had a customer that um, went looking for questions so there, there are PDF um, there are PDF library for Java so they they would go the, the founder he would go and look on Stack Overflow for people that were stuck with questions about how to make PDFs work and then he would answer them with his library which is an open source library and then um, and then link back to the code examples on on his site so he, he had this whole system set up where like the answers were on Stack Overflow, um, but they were still linking back and copying the content into his own platform. And that was, that was a good way. He also then republished it as a book, like the whole thing, which is kind of cool. Yeah. You, you probably need some sort of form of support. There's, uh, there's, some, there's some really interesting new technologies like Intercom. We've had them once here, actually, at Meetup. Yeah, I, I love the... the Combine combination of support documentation and chat and like this automatic reply thing I really really liked 
so it, yeah, just be conscious about your support strategy and think about it. Don't just say like, oh yeah, we're going to put a forum and people will answer their own questions. It's like, no, <laughs> that just never happens. Yeah. So developer experience is a lot of work. It does happen, but it's, but it might take weeks or you have to have like a very active community. Uh, if you're just starting, it's not going to happen. If you're, if you have like, one person looking at your forum, just asking questions into the void. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I mean, if you have lots of users. If you have a lot, of, but it's normally. Some of them are going to have opinions, and yeah. about some of them, you're going to wish they hadn't. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that's that's the other shadow side of the problem. Yeah. So. yeah. Higher than. Yeah. <laughs> at the top of the leaderboard, like the one that is like twice yeah. the points that everybody else, you hire them yeah. to work in the support of your company. And that's mm -hmm. how but it's a, uh, yeah, there's, there's a... Everybody who has an opinion doesn't have a solution. That's the <laughs> yeah. But ask, ask our colleague about leaderboards. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, also not good. <laughs> it's, it's, well, yeah, absolute leaderboards are really bad for gamification. Uh, yeah. So I, had I got this question when I did this talk the first time. Uh, was, so, okay, that's a lot of stuff. So where do I get started? <laughs> like, what is a good minimal viable product? And um, I think one way to look at the portal is that it needs to answer all these questions. And these are all the elements that answer those questions. Um, so what is this API? How to get started? And so on and so on. I'll give you a moment. And um, I think the most important questions of this list are probably these. If you have somebody who can write regularly for your portal, then probably you want a blog uh, because the blog is, is like, um, it's an unstructured space where you, can, um, where you can prototype new types of content. So if you have, if you want to start, if you don't have any tutorials yet, you can use your blog to publish your first tutorials. If you don't have any release notes yet, you can use your blog to do that. So it's, it's like, a, it's a really nice space to, to do that. And it's also a really good uh, trust signal that shows like, yes, we're alive, we're still working on this stuff. Um, you know, just yesterday somebody posted a blog post. It must be that they're still interested. We're, we're deprecating the API. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's... Uh, uh, so if you have the people for it, then do a blog also. If you don't, then leave it out. But I think these are really key. So what is this with good landing pages that show what is this for? How do I get started? tutorials, um, reference, because without reference, you can't do anything, and then uh, support. And, and like, yeah, th those four you really, really need. Without that, you shouldn't launch. Uh, and then you can add the others step by step uh, as, as, you, as you go along. And that's um, the end of the talk. Um, yeah. Everybody still awake? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah? You promised me to talk about APIs a dot. Yes. <coughs> oh, I didn't put I put that in. Yeah. Where did I put it? Oh, it's <laughs> gone. <laughs> so wait. Uh, let me drag it back in. Editing slides live. <laughs> Just, um, so um, I, I, I because I have questions and then I got this thing. If you want to know a lot more about developer portals, we've got a newsletter about that, um, where I'll also be publishing, or Laura probably will be pu publishing the, the recordings of today. Recording. And yeah, um, I hope it still works. <laughs> the, um, um, we also have um, an open source set of tools that we're working on to make developer portals, like the CMS-based portals, uh, based on Drupal, which is a PHP thing, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, and um, there's also a Ruby uh, project that Nexmo is working on. So it's still very early. So if you, if you have somebody asking you about developer portals, go look for Nexmo and open source developer portals. Okay. Um, and then um, uh, one of the key things I should be mentioning is that um, in April, we're going to have our next API to Docs conference that's going to be in Paris. Uh, you're all very welcome. It's free. It's a free conference. Um, we, yeah, we do it for free so that everybody can join. And 
um, so that everybody can learn, even even tech writers that might not have a job at the moment. 